Hi, Kevin. Hi there. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Pretty good. I am um, going to make you a co-host just in case anything um, happens with my audio or something like that. Okay. And then I'll give the other students about, well, I guess everybody's, most people are in the waiting room and I'll give it about one more minute and then I'll go ahead and get started. See something. Good morning. Morning. Um, I'm going to make you a co-host as well. Um, I just told Kevin, I'm going to make you guys co host as well, just in case anything happens with my audio or something like that, won't get cut off. Okay. And if you are ready, I will go ahead and um, let the people in that are in the waiting room. Um, Probably. Um, yeah, you can let the people in. Okay. But I need a minute. Okay. Can you see my um, title screen? Yes. Perfect. All right. I am ready when you are then. Just a couple more people to admit. All right, good morning, everybody. My name is Cassandra Stewart. I am one of the department managers for the Council of Education Department here at the Chicago School. Um, and we have with us Alina Porter presenting. So I'm going to give her some time to introduce herself, and then we will go ahead, um, go ahead and get started. You guys can type your questions or comments or anything like that in the chat. All right. Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to Rape by Omission: Nonviolent Sexual Trauma. As she said, my name is Alina Porter. A little bit about me. I am an alumni of the Chicago School of Professional Counseling with a master's degree in clinical mental health counseling. I'm a licensed professional counselor in Georgia, Alabama, and Tennessee in private practice. And I am one of only a few sex positive counselors in all three areas. Um, I believe sex is vital to our existence. And it pains me that so many individuals who have experienced non-consensual sexual attention or activities don't understand what happened to them and may not understand why it continues to affect them years later. I'm also a doctoral student working towards my doctorate in marriage and family therapy, and I am pursuing my ASEC sex, therapy, sex therapist certification, which I say all the time and never gets easier. Um, but I'm so happy to hear you, or happy to see you all here because I've wanting, been wanting to present on this topic for a couple of years after I experienced cognitive dissonance following an other than consensual sexual experience. You see, I didn't want to have sex with this person, but I felt obligated and trapped, so I acquiesced. I didn't say no because I felt like I couldn't, and there didn't seem to be a name for what I experienced, so I created one, rape by omission. 
and because I went through so many of the same after effects of rape, yet my experience didn't meet the legal or even literal definition of rape. And I know from working as a trauma therapist that my experience wasn't unique. So just a brief agenda today, we are going to talk about rape by omission, obviously, which breaks down into sexual coercion, partial consent, sexual compliance, rape by deception, some specific populations affected by sexual assault, and why sexual assault is rarely reported or prosecuted. I would like to apologize in advance for how heavenly gender this presentation is. It is not my intention to neglect or minimize the sexual trauma experienced by LGBTQ individuals, but most of the available research focuses on female assigned at birth sexual assault survivors. So what is sexual assault? Sexual assault includes most of the topics we will cover this morning. It's an umbrella term for sexual acts that are unwanted or non-consensual, including but not limited to attempted rape, fondling or groping, unwanted exposure to a person masturbating or people having sex. It covers unwanted sexual acts when consent cannot be given due to physical or mental condition, including the influence of alcohol or drugs. It may include actual or threatened harm, use of weapons, coercion, manipulation, intimidation, or deception. Sexual assault happens to men, women, and non-binary individuals, though the prevalence of perpetration against women is highest, at least in incidents that are reported. The Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, RAIN, reports that every 73 seconds, a person in the United States is sexually assaulted. So in about the length of time I've been defining sexually, sexual assault, someone has been sexually assaulted. Sexual assault can be difficult to recognize or prosecute because the per perpetrator is almost always an acquaintance of the survivor. In fact, eight out of 10 sexual assaults are committed by someone known to the survivor. Rape culture is a phrase that you'll hear me mention a few times today. It's a sociological concept for a setting in which sexual violence is both prevalent and normalized due to pervasive attitudes about sex and gender. Common attributes of rape culture thinking include slut shaming, survivor blaming, sexual objectification, trivializing and denying all types of sexual violence and sexual harassment, as you can see from the pyramid here, rape culture starts by normalizing behaviors such as catcalling, locker room talk, sexist attitudes, and rape jokes. And as you move up the pyramid, the behaviors get worse all the way up until rape. Tolerance of the behaviors at the bottom supports or excuses the behaviors at the top. To stop rape and all types of sexual assault and harassment, we need to stop acting like the behaviors at the bottom are normal or acceptable. Rape by omission is any time you engage in any kind of sexual activity that you would not willingly choose to do if you had the security and autonomy to say no. You may be wondering what specifically omission means in these situations. The part that is omitted is freely given consent. Rape by omission can occur Anytime you engage in non-consensual sex, whether or not you verbally said no or physically fought back, the point is you did not want to have sex. And because what happened to you may not meet the legal definition of rape, that doesn't change how you feel about the incident, the perpetrator, or yourself. I'm bringing this to you today because many clients discount or negate what they experienced as anything traumatic because they didn't say no, or they didn't fight, or it wasn't that bad yet they have persistent symptoms of having experienced a traumatic event. I literally can't guess how many times I've heard, my, sexual, my first sexual experience wasn't consensual, but it doesn't bother me anymore. Mm, doesn't it? These experiences can happen because in any situation which puts the client under duress to the point that the client feels that they can't say no, such as an authority figure or someone who has power over them for some reason, or they are coerced, manipulated, or deceived, or they have to consent to survive, or they feel obligated 
or they're unable to consent at all. I think this is the most powerful statement I have ever found about consent. You can never say yes until or unless you have the power to say no. There are many reasons a person may not feel like they have the power to say no. The person asking for sex is an authority figure or has some power over you in the workplace, in the military, in your household, or maybe you've just had sex with them in the past. It was staggering to see how many individuals across all ages and multiple studies reported that they believe consent is given in perpetuity. This one quote has been sticking in my head for weeks. A woman research participant saying, I would never have ever, ever thought of saying yes or no, as if actively consenting or refusing to consent is not seen as an option. If people, especially women, are not perceived as having the agency to choose whether they want to consent, then they will often comply with unwanted sex because they are unaware that they have any other choice. This is what consent should look like, enthusiastic and ongoing. I don't know if the Chicago School does, still does this, but when I attended here as new students, we had to complete a video course on consent and it talked about making sure you have consent at each stage of sexual activity. The word FRIES is an acronym that Planned Parenthood uses to teach consent, which stands for freely given, reversible, informed, enthusiastic, and specific. It's pretty easy to remember, but harder to apply in real world situations, as you will see in the next se section. Seduction, mildly manipulative, yet generally effective behaviors used to persuade a partner or prospective partner to engage in sexual activity. Mildly manipulative. Although the definition is true, you can see how mildly manipulative becomes overtly manip manipulative when mild doesn't persuade the person to have sex. What happens when seduction doesn't work? When people describe seduction, there is generally a feeling of encouragement, but also the autonomy to say no. Coercion reduces or eliminates the autonomy to say no. This could be achieved by manipulating or bullying the other person. Comments like, you have to, as my spouse, it's your duty. If you love me, you would. If you don't have sex with me, I'll go find someone else who will. Begging, saying please repeatedly to the point that the less willing partner begins to feel obligated to have sex so they don't hurt their partner's feelings or upset them. And finally, implying negative consequences, ending the relationship, cheating, removing financial support, physical harm. Sexual compliance differs from sexual coercion, although both are forms of unwanted sex. In sexual compliance, there's an absence of explicit or implicit partner pressure to have sex. Some of the reasons for sexual compliance are adherence to prescribed gender norms. You may think this only applies to women, but it does not. Men in romantic relationships who experience lower libido report engaging in sexual compliance because they believe it is expected of them to want sex more frequently than they actually do. For women who believe in stereotypical binary gender norms, they may comply with sex because they believe that women are supposed to be sexually passive and comply when their partner initiates. From a relational perspective, partners may comply with sexual activity to increase relationship satisfaction, promote partner satisfaction, or promote relationship longevity. And lastly, individuals will comply with unwanted sex to avoid fights and repeatedly having to turn their partner down, which leads to hurt feelings and greater relationship tension. Partial or ambiguous consent. This is one of two segments from Joy Short's TED Talk that I will share with you today. Joy Short is the founder of Consent Aware, okay, if I could talk, Consent Awareness Network and the author of four books on sexual assault. And this is her talk on partial consent. When I was 18, I was a student at the University of Georgia and I was going out with a, who was a senior 
I knew he wasn't my forever guy, even though we had a lot of fun. Uh, so we had a talk about sex, and I told him, touch nothing below my waist. I drew the line. One night, I felt his fingers going into my panties. I said, no. I yelled, stop, and I tried to break away from him. But he was much stronger than I was, and he pinned my arms behind me. He wedged his legs between mine. And he penetrated me. Did I ascend? I had agreed to some of his actions, but not all of them. And did I acquiesce? You know, after I tried to break away and I realized I couldn't, I froze. Today I understand that uh, sometimes uh, people react by simply freezing. Your brain goes into autopilot in order to protect you to the best way that it possibly can. And no one should ever stand in judgment over how you behave when you're sexually assaulted. If only it were true that no one did judge you. Arousal and perceived consent. I just want to share with you all the first part of the title of this particular article. Does this horny man think women want him to? As the title alludes to, this article was examining perceptions of consent based on sexual arousal. The problem with so many sexual assault experiences is that they become he said, she said debates, wherein the woman is reporting that she did not give consent, and the man is stating that she did not indicate non-consent, and in fact, behaved in a way that implied consent. This phenomenon is known as the overperception bias, which is the belief that men incorrectly oversexualize the meaning of women's behaviors. Further, since sexual interactions tend to involve emotional states, when emotions and situation-specific goals, such as sexual intercourse, combine, this combination may skew interpretation of female behaviors toward a confirmation of expectations. This is called motivated social perception or functional projection, wherein the male's interpretation of the situation conforms to his desires. Are women really consenting to unwanted sex just to be polite? Unfortunately, and apparently so. Sometimes girls are raised to be so polite, so nice and sweet, so people-pleasing, that they consent to sex just to be polite because they don't know how to get out of the situation any other way. They may not want to be rude to the person or they're worried about offending them. They may wonder if they've led them on. And they may not want to make them angry because they have certainly heard stories of men who have gotten violent. Legally, it's not rape. It's not even coercion. But nonetheless, these women feel icky, damaged, confused, lost, sometimes angry, and almost always questioning their decisions to consent and questioning if they can trust their own judgment in the future. Apprehensive consent is a yes that is given when someone feels threatened, coerced, or manipulated, or even if they are just not in an environment where they feel comfortable or safe enough to say no. This also ties in with the freeze response as Joy Short mentioned, which is a natural defense mechanism similar to the fight or flight response. People imagine that sexual assault is some big, huge attack or that it's always violent, but it so often happens in these really subtle ways and so few people talk about it. I'm sure we can all agree that no one should have to consent for, to unwanted sex for any of the reasons on this slide. Nonetheless, situations like this continue to exist. Let's say that you work a typical 40 hour week job that provides income you need for living expenses, food, rent, mortgage, car payment, as well as your health insurance. Now suppose your supervisor tells you that you have to have sex with him or he will fire you. And since you don't have a contract or a union and you live in an at will state, it will be your word against his if you try to sue him for sexual harassment, which Oh, by the way, you can't afford a lawyer anyway. All of those commercials, like, you know, we don't get paid unless we get money for you. 
there are really not that many lawyers that do that. I have a client going through that right now. It took her months and like 17 attempts to find the right lawyer. Anyway, so you have sex with this person. You have no savings, you live paycheck to paycheck and you have pre-existing health conditions. Theoretically, you always have a choice. Realistically, in this situation, you kind of do not. Hopefully, you start looking for a new job immediately, but for the time being, you continue to comply with this unwanted sex, and you start to feel increasingly hopeless and helpless. You feel dirty and damaged, even though you legally consented. Any one of these factors by themselves can create a state of deprivation or fear of deprivation severe enough that you will comply with sex. There's a big difference between being reluctant to engage in sexual activity and feeling obligated. Can you be deceived into consenting to sex? Lying blatantly or by omission to a partner or prospective partner in order to gain or maintain sexual intercourse, intimacy, and other relationship-related rewards is called rape by deception or rape by fraud. This is Joy Short again, talking about her experience with rape by deception. When I was 24, I met a man who I thought was the love of my life. He was tall, dark, and drop dead gorgeous. He was 32, he was divorced. He had a bachelor's degree from NYU in accounting. And uh, he had fought for our country in Vietnam. I felt head over heels in love with him as we dated over the next year and a half. And we were talking about marriage. One night he called me up and said, honey, I have something to tell you. I'm married. Not only was he married, he was 26, not 32. He wasn't my religion, which was a big deal to me. Uh, he didn't have a bachelor's degree in accounting. In fact, he was a high school dropout. And he hadn't fought in Vietnam. He had fled the country to avoid the draft. So did I assent? You know, I assented based on all of the information that he gave me. So on the face of it, I agreed. But he was a complete stranger to me. So did I freely give him knowledgeable and informed agreement? Today I understand that when someone undermines your self-determination over your body, by any means, by force, by duress, or by deception. They're not seducing you, they're sexually assaulting you. And this is Abby Finney talking about her experience with rape by deception when she was a student at Purdue University in 2019. There's someone touching me. Penny still has trouble talking about that night two years ago. Obviously, I assumed that was my boyfriend because I fell asleep with him. Only it wasn't. Abby discovered the man in bed with her, the man she just had sex with, was not her boyfriend. It was his friend, Grant Ward. You believe that you were raped? Yes. But the man she says raped her was acquitted in court. His record clear. Even after admitting, he tricked Abby. Just because they're lying or being deceptive doesn't make it rape. This case exposes a legal loophole in sexual assault laws across the country, sparking a national conversation about rape by fraud. The jury didn't get it wrong. The law needs to be changed. The law, by the way, has not been changed. So why is there so much confusion about what is and is not sexual assault? Because as adolescents, we're not taught about consent. And if they don't learn it then, when are they supposed to learn it? In a study of 2000 adolescents, ages 13 to 18, when asked if their parents talked to them about sex, most of the respondents said yes to at least one brief talk about sex. 
However, when asked if their parents talked about consent in those talks, only 31% of mothers and 19% of fathers talked to their children about consent. Those statistics are concerning on their own, but when coupled with only 35% of mothers and 20% and 20 of fathers talking to their children about reproduction, it is not surprising that so many adolescents and young adults have no idea if they were sexually assaulted or if their actions could result in pregnancy. This table is interesting for a couple of reasons. First, of those who experienced non-consensual first-time intercourse, 30.4% of them considered it rape, yet only 24.6% considered it a crime. What happened to that other 6%? Maybe the discrepancy can be explained by 72.5% considering it a mistake on their part. If it was their fault, then in their perception, it is not a crime. And this explanation came up way too often in my research. 30.4% of the non-consensual encounters and 8.7% of the consensual encounters attributed to the events to uncontrollable male arousal. This, this statistic right here is why sex education is so important. Young girls need to be taught that while yes, boys and men have little to no control over if and when they experience an erection, that doesn't mean they have to do anything with it. The young women in this study indicated that the average age of their partners, whether consensual or not, were between 17 and 18. That means that they're old enough to drive, in some cases old enough to vote and join the military. These men are supposedly old enough to make life and death decisions on the battlefield, yet somehow we also believe that if they experience arousal, they have to have sex. Somebody please help it make sense because I can't believe in 2020 when this study was conducted, young women still believe this. I can't believe I believed it in the 1980s or that my mother believed it in the 1960s and so on. Image-based sexual assault, also referred to as revenge porn and the use of slut pages. Although this does not qualify as unwanted sexual activity, it is still a non-consensual act involving a person's body. The term image-based sexual assault is preferred over porn because it embraces the understanding that the violating act of distributing private and intimate images and videos is a sexual violation. This behavior legally qualifies as sexual harassment and is punishable by law. Revenge porn websites were briefly wildly popular until legislator prohibited the distribution of these images, but behaviors didn't stop. Not only are a person's private pictures or videos distributed without their knowledge or consent, but often these images include their full names and contact information, otherwise known as doxing. Adolescent and young adult females are the largest population affected by this behavior, but the private images are not always posted by ex-romantic partners. What bullies and rivals have also been known to post explicit and embarrassing photos without a person's knowledge or consent. Individuals who have been affected by image-based image -based sexual assault often isolate themselves from the world. Some are forced to move because strangers would show up at their house. These individuals feel violated, traumatized, scared, and unsafe. Many of them experience PTSD, depression, anxiety, eating disorders, and suicidal thoughts or attempts. Male sexual trauma. One in six boys will experience sexual abuse before their 18th birthday, and one in four men reported unwanted sexual advances in their lifetime. That's an astounding number. But they don't walk into your door and say, hey, I'm here because I was sexually assaulted. They present for therapy for a multitude of reasons, but rarely initially disclose sexual trauma. They may have PTSD, but probably don't wanna talk about their trauma. They may have depression, anxiety, or both. There's a higher prevalence of eating disorders. Male clients may be ordered or strongly encouraged by their workplaces to participate in anger management therapy. They're more likely to experience one or more male sexual dysfunctions, such as premature ejaculation, erectile dysfunction, low desire, or inability to orgasm. When male clients talk about trauma, especially if it was from childhood, it is often with vague references like, I had a funny uncle, 
or my coach took a special interest in me, but when pressed, they will change the subject. Sometimes they will blurt out that they were sexually assaulted and then wait with their muscles tense as if they're expecting you to react negatively to, to their disclosure. And the reason they react like that is because some counselor did that to them in the past or friends or family, but very often negative therapeutic experiences. Male sexual trauma survivors are more likely than non-traumatized men to become addicted to sex, pornography, or substances. According to the Department of Defense definition in 2017, military sexual trauma is defined as intentional sexual contact characterized by use of force, threats, intimidation, or abuse of authority, or when the victim does not or cannot consent. From a mental health perspective, individuals who experience military sexual trauma are more likely to experience comorbid mental health disorders, including, but not limited to, depression, anxiety, PTSD, dissociative disorders, eating disorders, sleep disorders, and substance use disorders. Physiologically, survivors are more likely to experience chronic pain, liver disorders, cardio, cardiac or pulmonary disorders, hypothyroidism, obesity, and sexual dysfunctions. I created this slide with just the numbers to give everyone a minute to absorb the staggering prevalence of military sexual trauma. This statistic is from 2014. The Veterans Health Administration screened patients for sexual harassment and or sexual assault. And out of the 5.25 million patients screened, 30.2% 30 of women and 1.7% of men indicated that they experienced military sexual trauma. 32 point or 30.2% is a big number in and of itself, but when you look at 30.2% of 5.25 million, that is 1,585,500 women. And 1.7, that's a like teeny tiny number, except 1.7% of 5.25 million is still 89,000 men. These numbers are obviously higher now, almost a decade later. Additionally, this is probably an underestimate of the total number of military sexual trauma cases because many service members never report or admit to having experienced military sexual trauma. Plus the screening was conducted by the Veterans Health Administration where many military sexual trauma survivors will not or cannot go. When service women are assaulted it is often on military installations and by higher ranking individuals. Which brings us to institutional betrayal. Institutional betrayal is defined as an institution's failing to prevent harm and or creating environments that promote harm, causing behaviors and or responding to reports of incidents in ways that exacerbate harm to the victims. While yes, there are official channels for reporting military sexual trauma, many survivors do not report their experiences out of concern for their safety, whether explicit or implied, risk to their career, and therefore their entire professional identity, fear of blame or retribution. Unfortunately, these fears are not unfounded. Often survivors of military sexual trauma experience social, physical, or professional retribution. These survivors of military sexual trauma often experience secondary victimization in the form of institutional betrayal for military legal and medical systems, such as being discouraged from filing reports, legal or commanding officers refusing to file reports, telling the survivor their experience was not severe enough to pursue. The basis of betrayal trauma theory is that some institutions, such as military organizations, function by creating attachment bonds between leaders and subordinates and among members of a unit. In order to continue to survive and remain on active duty, many survivors of military sexual trauma experience betrayal blindness when the soldier forgets or blocks out all of their conscious awareness of their traumatic experience in order to maintain the necessary attachment relationship with their leaders and unit members. And this is why it doesn't show up for years, often when they retire or get out of the military prior to retirement age. Sexual minority women and men reported a higher prevalence of sexual harassment and assault than their straight peers. Specifically, lesbian and bisexual women respondents were more likely than straight women to report sexual harassment, 95% to 
and sexual assault 47% to 21%. Similarly, gay and bisexual respondents were more likely to report sexual harassment 77 to 41% and sexual assault 21 to 9%. Respondents were also asked if they had been misgendered or called a homophobic or transphobic slur and 12% of women and 15% of men reporting having experienced this form of sexual harassment. Over 50% of LGBTQ employees report being harassed at work. One perceived excuse for this behavior is a belief in gender deviance. Gender deviance can apply when a woman possesses stereotypically masculine traits or works in a male dominated field or can apply to anyone who does not uphold traditional gender norms. LGBTQ individuals also experience heterosexist harassment, which is hostility towards any non-heterosexual identity. Individuals who engage in gender harassment or heterosexist harassment report that their actions are acceptable because they were socially ignorant, harmlessly joking, or behaved in such a way to maintain the balance of power and their policing gender so that traditional gender norms were encouraged. Marital rape. I was so happy to find this video. Leslie Burnick is a biblical counselor and a licensed social worker and the author of seven books. When you go to her website, you are greeted with this sentence, we believe God wants you to live with safety, security, and emotional strength, whether your spouse changes or not. One of the reasons I was so happy to find this video is I had a very negative experience with a pastor of a church here in Columbus, Georgia. I had attended a few times, he was the cool pastor. His church was the type of place where you can wear jeans and he live streamed his um, sermons on Facebook. Very different from the severe strict pastor I grew up with. I was a student in internship at the time and I approached him to see if I could establish a consulting relationship. We had a great conversation about LGBT individuals, but when I asked for his opinion on spousal rape, he stood up from behind his desk and practically roared at me that spousal rape is a farce and should not be a law because a man cannot rape his wife. I tried one or two counter comments, but the conversation was escalating and I had not yet learned de-escalation, so I left and never returned to his church. I hope this will play. Is there such a thing? Okay. Try this. There's such a thing as marital rape. Many Christians and even church leaders would say no. They would say things like, it's not rape if you're married. Or the Bible says, your body's not your own. You're supposed to submit to your husband, even sexually. Or if you keep your husband sexually happy, he won't go hungry. If his choice to have an affair or look at porn would then be your fault for not giving him enough sex. Now, these statements miss the point. Rape isn't about sex. It's about power and control over another person. A healthy relationship must allow the individuals in that relationship the freedom that they know if it's going to be safe and healthy for both of them. Sex, even in marriage, requires two consenting adults. If your husband forces unwanted intercourse with you, it's all right not marital intimacy. There's something really messed up around the teaching in the passage of 1 Corinthians 7. Here's what it says. The husband should give his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but his wife does. So don't deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you might devote yourself to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. The context that Paul is referring to is that he's answering a question from new Christians who are married, but have been taught that abstinence is a good thing, even if you're married. Paul tells them, no, that's not true. Don't deprive one another because of this wrong teaching about abstinence. But the most important word here in this passage is the word likewise. You see, every woman in biblical times knew her conjugal duties. Patriarchal culture was a rule. And so what Paul is saying here is the same rule that applies to a wife applies to her husband. But that's not how it's traditionally used. A husband will often hold this passage over his wife's head to demand sex. He will say, see, you have no right to say no. The Bible says your body is mine. I'm entitled to sex whenever I want. But that kind
kind of selfishness goes against everything else the Bible teaches. For example, in Romans 12, 10, it says, love one another with, with, love one another with a brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Ephesians 5, 25 tells husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And 1 Corinthians 13 says, love does not demand its own way. And Acts 20, 35 says it's more blessed to give and receive. And Romans 13 says love does no harm. Sexual love in marriage is all about having trust and safety. That's why God tells you to wait until you have safety and trust of a committed marriage to have sex. God's not telling a woman here she has no right to say no. Her no should be respected, just like his no. There is nothing in the Bible that condones a husband forcing his wife into sex anytime he wants just because he's the husband. And if your husband forces or manipulates you into performing sexual acts that harm you, your body, humiliate your soul, make you uncomfortable or hurt you, it may be that he wants to reenact pornography that he's been watching. God does not ask you to submit to all of your husband's deviant sexual fantasies. And so if you've been a victim of marital rape, I am so sorry. It's wrong. God hates when someone treats another person like an object to use instead of a person to love. And especially so in marriage, where promises to love, honor, cherish, and protect have been so cruelly violated. Please don't keep us a favorite or feel that you must continue to participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness in this marriage. In most states, marital rape is a crime punishable by real jail time. Tell someone. You can't even call the police if necessary, get this to stop. God has given us legal authorities to help protect us against evildoers and those who harm us. You are not dishonoring your vows or disappointing God if you say no more to cruel, unforced, unwanted sexual intercourse. Like I said, I've had this idea about talking or writing about rape by omission for a couple of years now. And one of the factors I really wanted to include was marital rape because I've worked with several women and one man who experienced marital rape, but either they did not believe they were raped, despite how they felt, or they spoke to leaders of the church who told them that a man cannot rape his wife and a wife cannot rape her husband, for her body is his and his body is hers and that spouses should not deprive each other. My client's spouses have held that scripture over their heads, forcing and coercing them into having sex. Marital rape has been illegal since 1993 in all 50 states. So I should have been able to find countless scholarly articles on the subject, right? Nope. Not as marital rape, not as spousal rape, and only a small amount under the umbrella of intimate partner rape. 30 years, and almost no one is talking or writing about how these people feel and how to treat their mental and physical health needs following these experiences. One of the reasons that marital rape is so rarely talked about it is that it's incredibly hard to prove and prosecute especially if the person consents to sex, but that consent is due to coercion, threat, intimidation. Intimate partner rape or spousal rape are often nonviolent, so prosecution has no physical proof or witnesses that the person was raped. Additionally, there's a mindset among police, lawyers, and rape survivors alike that marital rape is not real rape because real rape is physically forced and real victims fight back. Other reasons marital rape is rarely prosecuted is that the perpetrator can claim the entire situation was a misunderstanding. Victim blaming occurs in all non-consensual sexual experience themes and marital rape is not different. In fact, one way victim blaming in marital rape is worse is because often the victim is told that if she just performed her wifely duty, her husband wouldn't have had to make her have sex against her will. And the last reason is that the defendants are often sympathetic and convince law enforcement and George juries alike that their partner did consent or that it was a misunderstanding. Since many people continue to have the misperception that rape has to be violent and the, if the victim is unharmed and the defendant does not seem aggressive, the jury is likely to dismiss the case if it even goes to court at all. Which brings us to why people don't report sexual assault. There are countless rape myths that make it difficult for survivors to accept what happened, report their assault, and be taken seriously by law enforcement. If a person dresses provocatively or goes to another person's home or bedroom, is drinking or using drugs or engages in any behavior to include kissing that could lead someone to believe that they were willing to have sex, then they ask for it. 
If they didn't fight back where they aren't bruised, bloody and hysterical, then it wasn't real rape. The person knew their assailant, it probably wasn't real rape, especially if that person is their spouse. If they had an erection or an orgasm, then the sex was consensual and they weren't raped. And this is a big one. If a person has consented before, that is somehow supposed to qualify as blanket consent for the rest of their lives. And it's not on this list, but important to note that consent can be revoked at any time and all sexual activity should stop immediately. There is no such thing as a point of no return after which a person, usually a man, cannot control themselves and has to finish the act. Male sexual assault survivors don't report their experiences because a lot of male rape myths are strongly rooted in dominant male beliefs. Essentially, the men can't be raped because if they didn't want it, they wouldn't get hard, right? Wrong. Physiological sexual responses have long since be de been debunked as proof of consent. Male rape myths further imply that real men would have fought back or escaped, as if it's beyond the possible belief that a man would acquiesce to sex just to get away from a perpetrator or situation. Or if the man is gay or bisexual and they enjoy sex with other men, that doesn't mean they've consented to every man every time they were approached or wanted to consent. Systemic betrayal by law enforcement. It's important to note, female law enforcement officers are more likely to believe that reports of sexual assault or rape are true, regardless of the gender or relationship of the perpetrator and survivors. Reports to male law enforcement officers have mixed results, but research indicates that male law enforcement officers are more likely to accept stranger rape and violent rape as true, and intimate partner rape and date rape as questionable or unfounded. Law enforcement officers determine which sexual assault re reports are referred to the district attorney for prosecution. If a law enforcement officer deems a report unfounded, then the survivor has limited to no ability to move their case forward which can cause secondary victimization and loss of trust in law enforcement. Law enforcement officers can also cause sec secondary victimization by disbelieving the survivor, asking them victim blaming questions, discouraging from filing charges at all, writing the report in such a way that discredits the survivor or actually threatening the survivor with arrest for filing a false report. If any of these negative experiences happen to survivors who report sexual assault, a cascade of additional negative issues can arise. The survivor loses trust in the legal system in general and in law enforcement specifically to protect them. Without the perceived protection of law enforcement, survivors feel unsafe. Additionally, due to invasive or victim blaming questions, the survivor may start to down their, doubt their own perception of events, which can cause cognitive dissonance. As with all sexual assault experiences, there's an increase of mental health issues. These mental health issues may make it difficult for the survivor to work and support themselves and so on. Systemic betrayal by the judicial system. The author of the article I used for this slide talks about what she learned in law school about how to discredit victims on the stand. Just so you're aware of the severity of this issue, the author only started law school in 2021 and this was published in 2022. So about two years ago, this is what they were and probably still are teaching. The law upholds the role of passive receptivity in women, whereas they are forced to prove an absence of consent and men are taught to assume its presence. Sexual assault crimes are the only crimes which the burden of proof falls on the victim. And the overarching theme is that rape culture invites people to spend enormous amounts of time finding any reason at all that the victim can be blamed for his or her own rape. The pictures I'm gonna show you are from Oregon State and Penn State University's What Were You Wearing exhibits, which allows survivors to explain the outfits they were wearing when they were sexually assaulted to debunk the attire means that you were asking for it. And it is accompanied, accompanied by a poem, what I was wearing. Maybe. What I was wearing by Mary Simmerling. What I was wearing was this, from the top, a white t-shirt, cotton, short sleeved and round at the neck. This was tucked into a jean skirt, also cotton, ending just above the knees and belted up. 
underneath all this was a white cotton bra and white underpants, so probably not set. On my feet, white tennis shoes and one place tennis in, and then finally silver earrings and lip gloss. This is what I was wearing that day, that night, that 4th of July in 1987. You may be wondering why this matters, or even how I remember every item in such detail. You see, I have been asked this question many times. It has been called to my mind many times. This question, this answer, these details. But my answer, much awaited, much anticipated, seems flat somehow, given the rest of the detail of that night, during which at some point I was raped. And I wonder what answer, what details would give comfort, could give comfort to you, my questioners, seeking comfort where there is, alas, no comfort to be found. If only it were so simple. If only we could end rape by simply changing clothes. I remember also what he was wearing that night, even though it's true that no one has ever. I will leave you with this final thought. Holly Richmond is one of my supervisors for my ASEC sex therapist certification. And in addition to being an amazing person, she is the author of Reclaiming Pleasure, a sex positive guide for moving past sexual trauma and having a passionate life. And I strongly recommend that for survivors and counselors alike. And my favorite quote from her book is, I don't care if you were sitting on the street corner naked, most people would have brought you a coat. The reason you were raped is because a rapist walked by. All right, hopefully I will have time to answer all these questions. We have about uh, five minutes left. Um, there are a couple, um, some students in the chat were asking if you were able to share the link to the TED Talk. Um, so I don't know if you want to put that in the chat really quickly so that they can go ahead and copy that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can share the link to the TED Talk. And then there were a couple questions. Um, Christian. Yeah, here, I'll put my email in here real quick. If anyone okay. wants the slides or has questions, don't do that, um, that I don't have time to answer. Someone wanted to know um, what the term is when an older sibling coerces a younger sibling to have sex. Um, that falls under sexual abuse or molestation. Um, and it happens a just disgusting amount of time. Um, let me see if I can get you the TED Talk link quickly. Um, but yes, that happens a lot. Um, I feel like there was another. Yeah. Um, though kids testing out their sexuality as yes, a lot adolescent cases are often dismissed because they think the kids are just trying to justify consensual sex and make it look good for their parents, like, you know, a sexual assault or rape. Um, I honestly, it, design this presentation is 90 minutes because I go to in-person conferences in Georgia and they're 90 minutes. So I had to cut um, a lot of it out. Are there any other questions you can um, read me really quick while I'm looking for the link? There was one more. Um, can rape by omission cause amnesia or not uh, recollect, recollecting, recollecting, sorry, the events? Oh, 100%, yeah. Um, I'm not sure when it was exactly that um, they added um, fawn and forget. But yeah, the forget is um, amnesia. Here it is. 
How do I share it? Ah, there we go. Share. All right, this is the Joy Short TED Talk. Um, but yeah, and like I said in the beginning, people, some people don't realize for years what um, had happened or why, or that anything that happened was non-consensual because eventually in these situations you acquiesce. So you think you consented and yet you still feel like you were raped and you just feel gross and icky and broken and you question yourself and everything. And it's a whole thing and it's a rarely talked about thing. Let's see, there was new messages. Yeah, for the clothing, I know. Um, I don't know that any, like these beliefs are so deeply rooted. Like I, you could literally smack every man or law enforcement officer or judge over the head with a book that says this is not true and I don't think it would get through. Um, but in talking about it and, and normalizing it and validating it with our clients, it's a very good first step in changing these beliefs. Were there any other like specific questions? There was one last question. How do we help police officers to modify how they are handling situations? And we have about a minute left. Um, well, they, first they have to want to, but like where I am in like the red state cluster, um, a lot of law enforcement officers' behaviors and beliefs are dictated by the communities where they live and the like leadership of the department. So even if you've got you know one or two open-minded law enforcement enforcement officers, if they're among like 30, 50, 60, 100, whatever, not open-minded, then they're less likely to try and you know buck the system. So sadly, I don't have an answer to that. Um, but it's a lot of it's a more systemic issue than just affecting law enforcement officer. Exactly, the system influences the individual. It's very hard to go against the grain, especially in such a like collective place as law enforcement and even the legal system. Somebody raised their hand. I don't know if they meant to. Yeah, I just like, I had spoke to um, a police officer about this exact thing and, um, they had shared that if the individual does not, the adolescent does not want to prosecute, then um, they kind of, they, I guess how they, how they um, word it to the family then is, I guess, similar kind of just kind of dismissing it because if the individual then wants to prosecute at a later date, then they have that opportunity to do that. That's how it was explained to me because I was irate <laughs> when that happened. Well, it gets worse than that. Um, forensic labs don't have the funding to test all these sexual assault kits. So they put women through very invasive and traumatic medical exams. And then the kits just sit on the shelves. They, you know, they only want like the real ones, the violent ones, the stranger ones. And if it's adolescent sex workers or intimate partner rate they're the like low low down the chain of being tested they're just not a priority for the limited funds and staff and all of that so the whole issue is systemic there's not enough funding for police not enough funding for forensics law schools are apparently still teaching this which was disgusting it's so sad because like, I mean, even when like this individual had used the term, I was raped and because she didn't want to press charges to her brother, then it was dismissed. Yeah. Well, that brings up like a whole, um, you know, probably multi-generational family trauma because how did the brother start doing that? Agreed. Yeah. Yep. I agree. Um, yeah, those are the, the hardest cases for me, sibling rape. Yes, yep. And I've had several, um, and almost always the family sides with the rapist. Yes, that and is exactly what happened. I don't have a psychological explanation for no. that. No, 
in all of the cases that I've had this situation in the family sided with the rapist. Yep. I've had it twice. Like I've, I've dealt with it twice and both times the, the family has sided with the rapist. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is plenty. Um, but yeah, grab my uh, email out of the chat. If you ever want to talk about this further, just um, send me an email. Yeah, great. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thank you, everyone, for um, joining us and sharing your thoughts and comments. And thank you again to Elia Porter for the wonderful presentation. I am going to go ahead and end this. Um, if you haven't had the chance to, the link to the TED Talk and also her email is in the chat. Um, let me see. My email again? Well, stay here. I don't know, but I'm going to copy and paste it one I more. I found it. Okay. <laughs> I just have to copy it. Hold on one second. It doesn't let us copy and paste, so I have to put it, write it down. Okay, it, yeah, it's, it's long, sorry. Oh, you're fine, thank you. I'm just gonna post it one more time. Thank you. No problem. Thank you so much, this was wonderful. You're welcome, thank you for coming. Absolutely. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end this now. Um, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one.